Um, Chris is not the speaker. I'm excited to introduce uh, the speaker tonight. We have with us uh, Demetrius Desnos. Demetrius is uh, the preaching minister for the Franklin Road Church of Christ, I guess across town, the other side of town. Uh, so he is here local. Uh, Demetrius is a former student of mine uh, at the Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies and uh, was, I'm not supposed to say that you have favorite students, but <laughs> when you're a teacher you can say that. And Demetrius is one of my favorite students. Uh, so I'm excited that he's here to be with us tonight. I know that you guys are going to be blessed uh, by his, his message. Uh, he is married to Chloe, and they have a sweet one-year-old named Naomi, but unfortunately uh, they are both under the weather and unable to be here tonight. Uh, but hopefully next time uh, you'll be able to meet them as well. But I'm going to invite Demetrius to come on up, and uh, we'll have a, a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over to him and let him preach to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have tonight to study from your word. Father, we pray that you'll be with Demetrius and that you'll bless him, Father, that you'll speak through him this evening as he breaks into us the bread of life. We pray, Father, that we will have open minds and open hearts and uh, we'll let the message that he presents sink deep within and help to change our lives, Father. Thank you for the good servant that he is. We pray that you'll continue to bless him and his family, bless the congregation that he works with, bless your people, Father, and may we always live for you. It's in Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. All right, good evening, everyone. I am uh, extremely glad and excited to be here with you. I uh, certainly appreciate the invitation to speak and to come and fellowship and hopefully just uh, share a few thoughts from a familiar story uh, that we all know. I, I'm going to try to do my best, uh, but I, I really enjoyed the skit, enjoyed everything that has already taken place. Uh, so if you have Bibles, you'll need them tonight. If you'll meet me in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 6. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. As Justin said, uh, you know, him and I, we know each other from my time there at the preaching school. And, uh, you know, Justin happened to be, you know, one of my favorite people um, as well. He taught a class, and that class was ministry practicum. Happened to be one of my favorite classes because, you know, in preaching school, you get uh, so much of the technical things. You learn about history, church history, the Reformation movement, all of these things, and it becomes a bit tedious. Uh, but ministry practicum kind of dealt with your day-to-day -day responsibilities in ministry, how you interact with people, uh, meeting folks where they are and encouraging them not to, to stay where they are, but to be where Jesus wants them to be. And uh, Justin, I'll tell you, he, he's a great teacher. He's a great friend of mine because he not only, you know, taught us, but he lived out the message that he taught. And so um, as we look at Genesis chapter 6, we're going to see the story about Noah and the flood. Our subject matter tonight specifically is God looking at him as the Savior. We know that God has a number of titles that he wears. There's a bunch of great things about him. But I want to talk a bit about how God is a Savior to each and every one of us. Uh, church, I've always loved the water. Uh, I don't know if anybody else loves water like I do. I've always had an affinity for it. Uh, my wife, she affectionately calls me a water baby, uh, whatever that means. But I, I think it's because, you know, anytime that we vacation, go somewhere tropical in the Caribbean, anytime there's a body of water, you can always find me in the water. Uh, swimming, uh, snorkeling, scuba diving, doing something because water is just that enjoyable to me. And so one, one year I remember my parents and I, when I was a kid, we went out and uh, we were vacationing there in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And so in the ocean, we, we went out and, and uh, they put chairs up on the sand and, and they set up the umbrellas, all of that kind of stuff. And so I was ready to go out into the water. And so my father, he stops me and he says, listen, I know you're ready to go out into the water, but before you go, remember not to go out too far. Uh, stay in, in a place where m your mother and I can see you uh, because we don't want you going out so far that we don't know where you're going to be. 
And so I remember, you know, being a kid, I, you know, had a big of a, a, a ego issue, pride issue, if you will, at the time. And so I thought myself to be a good swimmer. I was confident in my own abilities, uh, trusting that I, I could swim well. Well, I went out into the ocean, and of course, you know, that command he gave me just it slipped somewhere in the back of my mind. And so I was out there swimming. And uh, before you know it, I was out further than he told me to go. And so he looks back at me and he's waving his hand. He's like, come on in. He's telling me to come on to shore because I had gone out too far. Only problem is I got caught in what's called a riptide, a rip current. And if you've ever had any experience with a rip current, it'll take you out even further than you were before. And so that rip current, it got a hold of me and, and, and I couldn't even see my parents. They had been like dots on, on, the, on the seashore. And so uh, my mother, she's frantically yelling. My father, you know, he jumps in the water He's trying to get to me, but he's not that good of a swimmer. Uh, so nevertheless, uh, whenever you go to the, the beach, they have made provisions. There's usually lifeguards who are on duty. And, and the lifeguards, as you know, they sit in these big chairs. Uh, they sit on high and they look low, making sure that no one gets in danger. And that if anybody is in danger, it's the lifeguard's job to get down from where they are, to go into that body of water, and to bring that person back who has gotten so lost. Uh, my friends, if you'll look in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. You see, one of the things that just really reaffirms my faith about God is understanding that God is consistent. God doesn't change. And so the Hebrew writer says it this way in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. He said, God desiring to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, guaranteed it by an oath. He says, by two immutable things, or your Bible says, two unchangeable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Basically, he said there's three things. God cannot lie, God does not change, and God is consistent. I want you to know this evening that God has always been in the saving business. Long before Jesus ever went to Calvary, God made sure that he always had a plan to save his people. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, uh, you know it. Paul said that, I would have you know, I'm delivering to you by which the thing that I've also received, that Christ has died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day in accordance with the scripture. Now, when he says that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of those books, uh, none of those gospel accounts are recorded. So, so basically, when Paul says that, he has to be talking about the Old Testament. Furthermore, whenever you see the word scriptures in the New Testament, it's in reference to the Old Testament. And so, uh, in order to prove Paul's point and also confirm God's consistency, tonight I want to seek to find something in this story that teaches us about Jesus coming, uh, dying, being buried, and raising again the third day. Now, uh, our task is to find the gospel in the ark. And, and by the time that we leave tonight, each and every one of us, I want us to be clear and sure and, and, and absolutely confident that we see the gospel in the book of Genesis. So uh, the ark, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, uh, the Bible tells us that this ark, it served as an example for salvation. And so what he says, what Peter says, he says, like Noah and the eight who got in the ark, they were all saved by water. The Bible says in verse 20 that the antitype which now saves us is baptized. So that ark, you know, from a salvation standpoint, shows us that God had death, burial, and resurrection on his mind before Jesus ever comes to earth. So before we get to all the good stuff, we've got to set the stage as far as why man needed saving in the first place. And so what we see in Genesis, if you'll turn back there, Genesis chapter 6 and, and verse number 5, uh, that chronologically understanding that why man needed to be saved, I want you to know the first thing we see in this Genesis account, uh, chapter 6, is that there's a problem, and we see God the Savior in his natural habitat of solving that problem. And so the first thing that I want you to understand about this particular story is that when it comes to mankind's sin, God is grieved by sin. 
Sin grieves God. And so at this particular point, you remember God has created the earth. He's made man. He's made woman. He's made animals. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so he's created everything on the earth. Remember, he's a God who sits high and looks low, much like that lifeguard. And so when he looks down from heaven, he looks and he realizes that everybody's wicked. Uh, he, he understands that in this earth, all of these people who I have created, they've turned on me. And so when you look at verse number five, the Bible says this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The New King James says, and the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Now, some of your Bibles are going to say that God repented. I have an issue with this, uh, and, and there's an issue that, that some uh, folks and scholars and theologians have with this. They say that ultimately, of course, we know God cannot make mistakes. But if the Bible says that he has repented, does that mean that God made a slip up? a mess up or any of those things. Well, that word repent, it, it, it's not the word that you and I would use whenever we fall short and we need to change from our ways. That word there in your Bible means grieved. Uh, specifically, my Bible says sorry. So what, what Moses is doing here is he is giving God human qualities. He's giving qualities to that which is divine and that you see in each and every one of us as humans. And so God says that I am sorry. He was sorrowful that he ever made man, that he ever took the time to put him in the garden, to make him and fashion him after himself. God had regretted the fact, some Bibles say, that he had ever made man. So I don't know about you, but, but, but that, uh, you know, is a little bit clearer than saying God repented. Because after all, I don't want the God that I serve to make mistakes. I, I want my God to be perfect, uh, foolproof, you know, no errors or anything wrong with him. And so we notice from this text that God grieves with sin. But even in the midst of, of grieving from sin, God gives grace. I want you to understand, friends, that even though God will punish us for sin, he will always provide us with protection in the midst of that punishment. And so secondly, looking at the fact that God gives grace, I want you to notice uh, what he says in verse number seven. He says, now I need to destroy all flesh from the earth. But the next thing that we see is that God gives some grace. Now, Noah finds something interesting in the next verse that uh, you don't too often see in the Old Testament. The Bible says in verse 8 that Noah found grace in God's eyes. I say interesting because, again, we don't really see that term. Usually we think of grace, we think in the New Testament, after Jesus comes and he dies. But that word grace means favor. So Noah had God's favor show up uh, in his life. Now, this doesn't mean essentially that, that everything with Noah was perfect. It just means that God looked at him in a certain way that he didn't see everyone else. So just think everybody's evil, but the one man, Noah, gains, gains grace in God's eyesight. And so uh, the Bible also tells us that when we look at God giving grace, this is consistent. John chapter 1 and verse 16 tells us that when God became a man, he became flesh, took upon him the form of a servant. Philippians said that he came to bring grace upon grace. All right. So, so God says to Noah, if you'll look at verse 14, Genesis 6 and verse 14, God says, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence, uh, the Bible says, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Then he says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. All right, so watch God's divine grace. God says he's going to destroy everything and everybody, but he says, I'm going to make a way of escape for you, Noah. So watch this. Everything about the ark, I want you to understand, has a reference to Jesus. Everything that we'll see, and, and we'll point that out in the scriptures momentarily. Now, when we think about the ark as mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, there's three different occasions in the Old Testament where you will see a reference to an ark. All right, we have Genesis chapter 6. There is the ark uh, of Noah, which saved us or saved them from God's wrath. And then, of course, you have in Exodus chapter 2, what Moses was put on, that ark that saved him from Pharaoh's wrath. And so ultimately, you remember that Noah, or Moses rather, was put on this ark. He was sent down a river, and he was drawn out of that river. That's why we call him Moses. And so that ark protects him from Pharaoh, who's depicted here 
as Satan. But the third ark that you have a reference to in the Old Testament is the Ark of the Covenant. And that's what God puts his law in. And so I, I mention all of that just to suggest to you that every time God uh, mentions an ark, builds an ark, it's for the purpose and intent of salvation. So the first ark, that's going to save you from God's wrath. The second ark, that's going to save you, Moses, from Satan. But the third ark will save you from God's law because you can't keep God's law, right? And so every time God builds an ark, he's depicting salvation on the purpose of somebody. So uh, what we have to do is we have to examine this ark, this ark of safety that God has given us. And so we'll do that with the rest of our time tonight. And so the third thing that we understand about God, God being the Savior, is that when it comes to salvation, he requires provision. God requires provision precision. He is very specific uh, when it comes to salvation. God is precise even when you look at the choice of wood. Uh, He says, I want you to use gopher wood, not pine wood, not cedar wood, but I want you to use gopher. Now, gopher wood, uh, couldn't really find much about it. Gopher wood is uh, extinct. Uh, we, We don't really use that today, of course. But God knew that the power was not in the wood. The power was in his command. Because after all, if God said use something else, you'd probably get the same result, right? Because again, it's in what God says, not essentially uh, the thing itself. And so let's keep reading because after God tells him what wood to choose, God says, I also want you to make rooms in the ark. Now, if you have a pen or a highlighter or something, I want you to underline that word rooms in your Bible. That word room mentioned there in the Old Testament is not the word that is typically used for room in the Hebrew. This particular word room, it translates nest, uh, essentially like a bird's nest, if you will. So the connotation of, of nest is a resting place, all right? And so he says, I want you in this ark to make resting places. Why, why is that important? Make resting places or rooms in the ark so that when I send my wrath, everybody who's in the ark will have a place where they can rest. Jesus says something similar in the New Testament. Again, God's consistent. John chapter 14, when he says, I'm going away for a little while. He says, I'm going to my father and there you can also be. And he says, in my father's house, there are many rooms or resting places. And so so that's important because you have to understand that safety is in the resting place. As a matter of fact, I like the way that the psalmist mentions it in Psalm 46. Uh, You may remember where the psalmist says, God is a refuge. He's a very present help in time of trouble. And then he says, though we will not fear. We're not going to fear. Even though the earth gives way, uh, though the, the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. And here it is, this very small but strong word. He says, Selah. That word is extremely important there because what the psalmist does is he paints this this kind of poetical picture of being in the midst of utter chaos and calamity, of devastation and destructions all around you. Because I mean, honestly, think about it, that the world around you is is ultimately being destroyed. Everything's changing. Uh, uh, Mountains are upending. The world's being, in a sense, uncreated. And so what we have here is the psalmist says, but God's my refuge. He's my stronghold. He's my pavilion, my safe place, my resting place. And then he says, say la, which means to take a rest. So in the midst of tragedy, I'll take my rest because I can trust in God's protection. I can trust that God will make a way out of out of no way. And so we're still in Genesis chapter six, verse 14 in Noah's narrative. And so Genesis chapter six, verse 14, if you'll flip back there, the Bible then says, God says, and cover it inside and outside with what he calls pitch. Uh, I also want you to underline that word pitch because this word also is not the word that many uh, in the Hebrew language at this time who spoke Hebrew would use for the word pitch. Uh, This word pitch translates in uh, um, English, it translates, it's a word uh, kofair. I'm probably butchering that. Uh, But kofair means to atone. So what he says is he says, I want you to cover it inside and outside with pitch. Basically put a covering on the ark, atone the ark, all right? So, So he does 
does that, and he ultimately wants Noah to make it so tight where it's sealed proof to where no water can leak or get inside. Because God needs everybody inside this ark to be safe. That nothing on the outside can leak in or creep in or get in. The unfortunate thing for many of us is when we look at the ark of safety today, which we know to be the church, uh, the church has not been as sealed tight as God meant for it to be. We have all these things in our world that are starting to creep into God's church, into God's ark of safety, and God never meant for that to be the case. God meant for us to have influence over the world, not the other way around, but too often that's what we see, is it not? And so when we look at uh, the ark of safety, matter of fact, let's keep reading, because he doesn't want those in this ark, Noah and his family, to be touched or, or drowned in these, these dangerous waters. The Bible then says, and this is how you shall make it. This is verse 15. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Now, uh, this ark, many scholars will say, is about, you know, three football fields long. It's essentially, if you took about three Nissan stadiums and put them all side by side, you know, that's what we're talking about when we mention how long this ark is. And furthermore, it took Noah about 120 years to build this ark. Hold that in your mind. Now, here's where things get interesting. Because, you know, I know tonight is about God, God Almighty and all of that, but I'd be remiss and I feel a bit inclined to, to make a footnote about Noah's faith. Because Noah has to have great faith because, faith, because first of all, Noah has never seen rain. Up until this point in Noah's life, God has never dispatched or sent rain. And so just imagine if you're Noah receiving these instructions about what's going to happen from God, and he tells you, I'm going to make it rain, I'm going I'm to send a flood your way. Noah in his mind, he, he's never seen this. You know, let me add a little bit to that. Noah at the time of the flood is 600 years old. Uh, you heard me right. And, and so just think about that. I mean, I'm glad that, that people don't live to be 600 years old today. Uh, can you imagine how stubborn, right? Uh, it, because I'll tell you what, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to put an age on it, but if you've ever tried to tell your parents or your grandparents something that was for their good, but, you know, they've been living here quite a while, usually it's hard to tell people who have been here for so long something. I'll speak on my own behalf. You know, my grandmother, if I ever try to tell her, you know, Grandma, you need to get to the doctor. You need to make sure you're keeping your appointment. She'll tell me, you know, I'm living four times your lifespan. Uh, you can't tell me anything. Have several seats. I'm just thinking about my, my own grandmother. And so, so, so just think about that. No one living all of this time, 600 years. I mean, we think folks who, who are up in age are set in their ways. Think about a 600-year-old man, right? And so uh, the faith of Noah, that, that ultimately when confronted with what would happen, he doesn't challenge God, he doesn't question God, at least we don't have uh, any record of that in the text, but he does what God says. Uh, a little bit more on that, you know, I think about my wife. My wife is a physician, a doctor by trade, and, uh, you know, it's quite funny. You think about how long those who are in the medical field, doctors specifically, have to go to school for it. Uh, undergrad in, in med school and then their residency on top of that. My wife is the only doctor in the family. But in our family group chat, if somebody's sick, everybody's chiming in, everybody's diagnosing them, giving advice. And she's the only one who's went to school because what happens is people take their lived experience and a little bit of ego, and they marry those two things together, and you can't tell them anything, right? And so there comes a certain point in each and every one of our lives where we have got to set our lived experience to the side and simply do what God says. Our problem is we start getting creative. Uh, we start looking for loopholes in what God has already legislated. And, and I mention that because, you know, you know how we are. Uh, well, he didn't say I couldn't do. He, he didn't say I didn't, uh, I couldn't bring this or, or I couldn't add that, right? But if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 14, when he talks about the blessings and the cursings that come with obeying or disobeying God's word, uh, specifically the text tells us in Deuteronomy that do not veer to the left or to the right of any of the words that I have said. In Noah's case, I submit that salvation hinged on that. It hinged on Noah doing specifically what God said. Uh, I remember when I was uh, a bit younger, about 10 or 11 years old, my family and I, we lived in Buffalo, New York. Uh, in Buffalo, it, it seemed like there was a convenience store on every, every street corner. 
So one day my mother, she asked me to go to the store for her to get some items uh, for dinner. And so she gave me a $10 bill. I rode my bike down to the store, got specifically what she wanted, all the items she wanted me to purchase. I purchased those, but I wasn't expecting to get any change. Um, I'm sure y'all know what happened next. Uh, options opened up for me. I got what she wanted, but now I had options to get what I wanted. And so I spent every single penny of that change. I rode my bike back home, and of course, uh, my mother was displeased. Now, I won't disclose how she disciplined me. Uh, those were different times. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, I'll tell you, when, when it comes to that, that specific time in my life, I learned a simple but valuable lesson that obedience is doing what God says, nothing more and nothing less. The next thing that we learn about Noah, or learn about God rather, from Noah's story, is that not only does God require precision when it comes to salvation, God also makes provision. All right, so let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse number 16. He, said, he then says, you shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it a cubit from above. Set the door in the ark and its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks, as you see behind me. So, so God makes provision, right? Here's the blessing. Notice where he says to put the window. Uh, he says, I want you to put the window, place the window up above. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but I would expect for a window to go in the side, right? Uh, but, but God fashions it or tells Noah that, no, don't put it in the side, because if you put it in the side of the ark, you're going to be looking outside at everything that's going on around you. And so don't put it in the side, but rather I'd have you put it up above, because if you need to see, don't look outside. Nothing outside is going to help you. Uh, all you'll be focused on is the people crying and drowning and losing their lives of the flood waters. But if you look above, you'll end up focusing on me, waiting for my next instructions. And so not only that, but, but, but ultimately when we look at God's provision, look at the next part of that verse. He says, not only do you set the window up above, but he says, set the door in the ark in its side. All right. Uh, so he says, now the door of the ark I want you to put it in the side of the ark. Uh, again, you know, this door that they entered into to be saved is in the side. Uh, now, why not the front? Why not, why, why not the back? Uh, you know, some boats or many boats, uh, you know, I went to Italy not too long ago. My wife and I celebrated one of our um, anniversaries. And so we got to go to Venice, you know, that city that's surrounded essentially with, with water. You have to take gondolas and, and water taxis to get around. And so in those water taxis, they have a, there's a front door and there's a back door in, in those taxis. Uh, but the door is not really on the side. All right. And so, so, of course, you know, God says put the door in the side. But there has to be significance to that. And here it is, because when I looked at the fact that God said, put it in the side, not only that, but do you notice that there's only one door? You think about this large structure, three football fields long, this massive thing, uh, three Nissan stadiums, we'll use that imagery again, and there's only one way to enter in. There's only one way that you can get in, or one way that you can receive the salvation of the ark. But again, the door is in the side. And if you look in the New Testament, John chapter 19, verse 34, the Bible tells us that Christ, while being crucified on the cross, when they wanted to see if he was dead, he was pierced in the side, and out came blood and water. Uh, furthermore, all of this has to connect to the door, has to connect to Jesus, door in the ark. And I know that's true because Jesus was saying, John chapter 10, he said, I am the door. And then furthermore, flip over a couple pages to chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way or the entry point. Nobody gets to God except uh, through me. So there's so much salvation that God provides in the ark. The symbolism is clear. The foreshadowing is clear. Then he says, make it with lower, second, and third decks. And so, of course, we know that there's three stories in the ark. Some scholars will say that these represent the triuneness of God. He's, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Some say it's the trichotomy of man. He's mind, body, and soul. Uh, I don't have a clear answer for you except to say that God knew what he was doing. And that's good enough for me. And so let's read verse number 17. He says, And behold, I am I myself am bringing the floodwaters on earth to destroy under heaven all flesh, which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Last thing that we learn from Noah's narrative 
about God is that God offers an invitation. All right, so look at chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, I got to make up some time here. He says, the Lord says to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me and this generation. Now, I read past it, but, but the one word that, that I want you to understand in verse 1 is he says, come. Uh, that word, when he says come into, uh, essentially it lets us know that ultimately in order, whenever you tell somebody come into your home, it's because you're already inside. And so I know that it's an invitation. This tells me that God invites him into a place that he already is in. And that gives me a little bit of encouragement, specifically understanding that God, when he gives this invitation, he's inviting you to a place where he already was. You remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. How about the other invitation there, John chapter 4, Jesus and the, the woman at the well. And so after she has this encounter with Jesus, she says, come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. And so the last point that I want to give you, and I'm missing some stuff, but uh, when we look at the gospel in Genesis, understanding something about the ark. I gotta understand, I gotta get you to the third day. If you look at Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 4, the Bible ultimately tells us that, uh, <clears throat> the Bible tells us Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4 that the ark rested on Mount Ararat. Now, here's what I want you to understand. In, in, in the seventh month, the Bible says this, in the seventh month, on the 17th day, the ark rested on Mount Ararat. Now, the seventh month in, in the Hebrew calendar is the month of Bib. Exodus chapter 12, that month of Bib, the seventh month, is going to become the first month. And God says in this month, what I want you to do is take the Passover lamb, and I want you to slay it, kill it. And he says on the 14th day, Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, he says, kill it on the 14th day of the seventh month. Jesus, who is our New Testament Passover, when he goes into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, he is crucified on that same day. That Friday evening would be the 14th day of the seventh month. And so if the ark rested on the seventh day, uh, the seventh month of the 17th day, and Jesus ultimately is crucified on that 14th day. If you add three days to that, then Jesus will get back up on that 17th day. And so what I want you to understand is that the ark rested the same day that Jesus was raised from the dead, the seventh month on the 17th day. So even back in the book of Genesis with Noah and the flood, we see that God foreshadows death, burial through the waters of the flood, and resurrection. And so the last thing that I have, you know, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, is that Peter says that the spirit of Christ was in Noah a long time ago. So even when we see Noah preaching in Genesis, really it's the spirit of Christ that was in him. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus preached to those spirits that were in prison. That doesn't mean that after Jesus, you know, died, uh, that he went back and he preached in the Hadean realm. That's not what that means. That's what some people will suggest to you. But just look and, and listen to what the text says. The Bible says, for Jesus also suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering of Noah waited, uh, long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, that is, few, eight souls were saved by water. Those in the ark were brought safely through that water. That is pictured as a type of baptism. And we also understand that when we look at this flood, he calls it, he calls it baptism in verse 21. That's your antitype. The ark is a type. Baptism is your antitype. I know that people today will say that baptism is nothing more than an outward show of, of inward grace, but, but I know that's not, that's not true. I know that's not true. What we know is that God ultimately, through the death of his son, provided us with an opportunity. See, when we get baptized, it's like us making an agreement. Uh, specifically, when he says in verse 21, it's the answer of a clear conscience. That means that you and I, we are making an agreement with God. It's, it's contract language. And, and the last thing that I'll leave you with is this. That agreement that, that we made with God when we got baptized, however many years ago, uh, sometimes, you know, we don't hold up our end of that agreement. Sometimes we grieve God by the sin in our life. Uh, 
But even in the midst of, of God's griefs, he provides grace. Uh, and when we look at salvation, God requires precision. Uh, he will make provision. And lastly, he'll give you that invitation to come back to him. Uh, much like my father, who was trying to get me to come back on the shore when I was in danger in the, in the waters, uh, God also invites us, those of us who have lost our way, to come back to him. And so for the rest of this week, just think about that. Think about all the things that God has done to make salvation possible for each and every one of us. Just because we're saved as Christians does not mean that we're safe. Uh, pray with me. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, just allowing us to have this time, this opportunity as brothers and sisters in Christ to spend some time in your word and to see what you have to say uh, about Noah and the flood. Lord God, we thank you for saving Noah and his family and by extension of that, making salvation possible for each and every one of us through the blood and the death of your son. Uh, God, we ask that you will just continue to show us grace and give us grace, even though we don't deserve it but for the purpose of us being able to use it and, and extend it to others as well. We love you, we, we love your son, and we're so grateful that you loved us enough to give us him. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you for your time and your attention this evening.